On this episode of the John Campion Show podcast, John Wick 5 is now official. It's coming. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 now has a runtime, and it's the longest in the history of the franchise. Transformers Rise of the Beast has better first reactions than we thought they was going to have. Also, The Little Mermaid's opening night preview has made more money than Aladdin did on its preview night, and that movie went on to make over a billion dollars. Also, Barbie dropped a new trailer, and it makes it look like a very different movie than I think a lot of people are expecting. That that and a whole bunch more. The John Campy Show starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, The John Campy Show, brought to you in part by our friends at Mint Mobile. I am, of course, your host, John Campy, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies, movie news, TV, streaming, all sorts of good stuff, not just giving you our opinions, but giving you information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different from ours. Joining me in the studio here, over here, we got Ray Ora. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sitting beside him is Jonathan Voico. Well, good morning. And of course, Chris Carr is here. Hi. And uh, most importantly, you guys are here. Thanks so much for making this podcast a part of your day. And here's how today's show is going to go. We break it into two parts. In the first part of the show, we're going to talk about those predetermined topics that I mentioned. Then in the second part of the show, we're going to take questions from our YouTube channel members. Now, we put up a post in our community tab asking our YouTube channel members if they have any questions for the show. We'll go through just as many of those as we can once we get into the last part of the show. All right, guys. With all that said, let's dive right into it, shall we? We made a video about this this morning. Um, you know, John Wick... It's an incredible franchise. I love these movies dearly. And I think a lot of people forget, much like they forget about Robert Downey Jr. You know, when people think about Robert Downey Jr., they think superstar, global icon, all that kind of stuff. But they forget that before Iron Man 1, his career was pretty much done. He had kind of sabotaged his own career a couple of ways. But thank goodness he got himself you know, out of the rut that he was in. He put himself back on his feet. John Favreau and the folks at Marvel gave him a shot to play Iron Man and the rest is history. But a lot of people forget that before the first John Wick film, you know, Keanu Reeves' career was kind of at its end point, you know? People weren't watching or talking about Keanu Reeves anymore and then John Wick came out and reminded everybody what a global treasure John Wick, or I should say Keanu Reeves, really is. And thank goodness. Now, we got to the end of John Wick 4. And, you know, we'll, we'll say what happens at the end because the movie has now done its theatrical run and it's available online and on streaming. If you haven't watched John Wick 4, you're not all that interested in it. So here it is. John Wick dies at the end of John Wick 4 in a beautiful, poetic, meaningful way. He dies. Now, granted, we never saw him die. I mean, we saw him collapse. And then they cut to a graveyard, but I mean, we never saw no body go in the basket. We didn't see any of that. So while a lot of people, myself included, thought, you know what? That's the end of the line for John Wick. The world of John Wick will continue through Ballerina and the Continental and other spinoffs, but that's it for John Wick. Thank you, Keanu Reeves, for giving us this incredible character. Well, not so fast. Because when you go back, and we talked about this in the video earlier today, John Wick is one of those very few franchises where every single movie, number one, made more money than the one before, and number two, had an even higher critic rating than the one before. It's hard not to keep that thing going. Uh, John Wick 1 made $86 million. John Wick 2 made $171 million. John Wick 3 made $327 million. And John Wick 4, the newest installment, made $428 million, being a franchise high. And they, the critic ratings were 86%, 89, 89, and 94, respectively. And one of the things I said on the video earlier today was that when you're Lionsgate and you're not a major player, all due respect to Lionsgate, I love that studio. But, you know, when you compare Lionsgate next to Paramount and Disney and Warner Brothers and, and you know, studios of that ilk, they're a smaller studio. And when you're a smaller student, you've got a hit franchise like this. Well, you treat it like you do the Hunger Games. You keep going back to it. That's why we're getting a song of snakes and ladders because they just cannot let you get, listen, you're a small studio. You got these little franchises. You want to keep them going. You want to keep making that money. And I would have been fine, Chris, mm -hmm. 
I would have been totally fine had this been the end of John Wick, you know, with, with four ending, the way it ended, the story of it, totally good. I'm totally happy with it. Great. But I am not going to lie. I want to see more John Wick. Yeah. I want to see a new John Wick episode every week. If, if you give me the opportunity, I got to see a bigger body count. I don't know. You, you hear about this, mm -hmm. John Wick 5, <laughs> the execs over at Lionsgate have confirmed they are now developing, they're already in development for John Wick 5. They haven't given us any sort of a timetable as to when, but it's coming. What do you think? Right move, wrong move? What are your thoughts? I'm going to sound so hypocritical because when we were talking about Star Wars, I was all, Padme's dead and she's dead and that's it. <laughs> I don't care if John Wick is dead. <laughs> Give me more of him. I love this franchise so much. My sweet, sweet uh, Lyft driver on the way to CinemaCon ruined the ending for me, and he felt so bad. But he just went, you're going to a movie convention. I figured you should know. And I was like, you're totally right. I should know, sir. <laughs> so sorry if anyone here is spoiled, but you guys star. should know. <laughs> I, gave, I, I tipped him still. I was like, you're great. You're a sweet man. Um, but so I would love to see so much more of this franchise. And you could do prequels. You could do before. Before John met his wife and everything, you could go into all of that. But I also still want it to be Keanu. Yeah. You know, he is John Wick. So I would love to find some workarounds here for him to continue on. I would love to have maybe flashback moments with him or something. I just want to keep this franchise alive because it's so fun. And I love Keanu Reeves so dang much. I can have this just completely defy all logic as long as I get more. You know what's great about your story is that, uh, that the guy who... Your cab driver, right? Mm -hmm. or, or Uber, Lyft. Yeah. Um, he was excited about John Wick. Yeah. So he was talking about it just out of nowhere. He, he We said we were on the way to CinemaCon. He says, you know what movie I really liked recently? But nice. I, I hated the end because it, <laughs> it was, I loved it. But now I'm really upset because I want more of this franchise. Nice. Now, in yeah. your defense, Chris, mm -hmm. in your defense about you thinking being uh, hypocritical, I mean, in Star Wars, though, we literally saw them burn Padme's body. This is very right? true. In the John Wick 4, I mean, Jonathan and I were talking about this off camera. Like, yeah, sure, we saw him collapse. But then what we didn't see when the cameras go off is that Winston probably picks him up, takes him to a hospital, fixes him up. And he says, nobody must know I'm still alive. So they put in a fake body into a into uh -huh. a coffin and down yeah. he goes. If I don't see you become the dust that's going in your urn, <laughs> then you can come back. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things I said, there's, there's a couple of things I want to see in a John Wick 5. Or, yeah, John Wick 5. Number one. I want to see time pass because if I remember correctly, like the events of John Wick 1, 2, and 3 all take place like within the same week of each other. Like it's all like immediate and even John Wick 4 isn't that far in the future. So a lot more time has passed, I think, in the real world than has passed in the John Wick world. So it'd be great to see some time pass. Mm -hmm. I also want to see him take over the head table. I want to see him become the head of the head table. Ooh. Because I, I think that's the only thing left to go because you, Jonathan, you and I were talking and you said... But how do you bring John Wick 5 back? The whole the whole quest of John Wick right from the very first movie was to get out of that life, mm -hmm. to get away from it. And that's when I suggested, well, what if he's taking over? So he's not under the yoke of the head table anymore, but he's rather the head of it. I, I don't know. Like, you scratched your head a little bit when we were talking about John Wick 5. Is this something you'd be down for? I kind of felt like at this point he just needs to become like a lethal protector um, outside of the system. And that's almost like I, an equalizer. Yeah, that's Ooh. what I would kind of like to have seen, um, or maybe even like helping others from underneath the weight of the uh, high table. Oh, the high table, so create yeah. his own underground railway for escaping the high table, sort of thing. Yeah, or maybe just victims of of the high table. Mm -hmm. my, my, oh, my, I just want to see him be a pure good guy. Sorry, that's all. I'm my to thing say. is like completely different. He should be the head of an animal shelter. <laughs> He's gonna have so, right. as time has passed. As That's time has passed, he's gonna have a lot of dogs <laughs> next time. So please don't ever touch and the dogs. It'll be called Paw Patrol. <laughs> and you gotta bring back Halle Bailey. Uh, I keep now I'm saying I could not I could never say Halle Bailey's name without saying Halle Berry. And now I'm trying to say Halle Berry and I'm saying Halle Bailey. Bring back <laughs> uh, Halle Berry uh, and bring her dogs. Yeah. Back to, I loved her dogs. Mm -hmm. And her silver hair. And her center storm hair. Yeah. Bring that all back to perfect. All right. With that down, uh, let's move on to this next thing here. One of the movies that we have been really excited for is Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning. Sorry, Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning Part Part One. one. Gosh, John. Right. I. What am I thinking? So <laughs> they showed us not at this most recent CinemaCon that was a few weeks ago, last month, but last year. 
at CinemaCon, they showed us a shit ton of stuff. And they were pumping this Mission Impossible movie a lot and been getting us excited and all this kind of stuff. Now, new trailers come out. The movie looks fantastic. Yes, yes, yes. But one of the big stories that's been surrounding Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning has been the runtime. One of the studio executives went on record recently and said, yeah, they they brought us a four-hour cut. It's got to get brought down a lot. So there was a four-hour cut of the movie. Now, that's not unusual most movies bring in a cut that is very, very long. And then it gets, you know, to give the studios, a, the, their studio and distributor a sense of what the movie is. And then it gets cut down even more from there. But apparently it was that. And so a lot of people thought this might be a three hour plus movie. Well, according to a report coming out of IGN, it's now official. Mission Impossible is, Dead Reckoning, is the longest of the Mission Impossible movies. But it's not hitting that three hour mark. According to the reports, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 will have a runtime of two hours and 36 minutes, but that does not include credits. Now, officially, when a movie's runtime is official, it includes credits. So really, the official runtime, even if this does come in at two hours and 36 minutes without credits, that probably means 245 is going to be the official runtime or something like that. Now, to put that in context, here's the runtime of all the Mission Impossible movies. Mission Impossible 1 in 1996 had one hour and 50 minute runtime. Mission Impossible 2 had two hours and three minute runtime. Mission Impossible 3 got a little bit longer at two hours and six minutes. Ghost Protocol in 2011 got a little bit longer at two hours and 12 minutes. Mission Impossible Rogue Nation in 2015 had about the same runtime at two hours and 11 minutes. And then in 2018... Mission Impossible Fallout had the longest runtime in the series at two hours and 27 minutes. But remember, that includes credits. This one, two hours and 36 minutes without credits. So you're probably looking at an official runtime that's going to come close to being 20 minutes longer than the previous longest movie in the installment. And this is only part one. Yeah. This is only part one. Then we've got part two coming. Anyway, Chris, you, you hear the runtime. I mean... In relation to all the, I mean, this is going to be almost an hour longer than the first Mission Impossible movie. It's only part one. I don't know. Does this, some people hear about long run times, they get excited. Some people hear a long run time, they get nervous. I don't know. You're hearing this. What do you think? Just how many motorcycles can Tom Cruise jump off of? <laughs> many what is motorcycles. Going on? Uh, He'll be in a canoe in the next <laughs> truly, one. Truly, <laughs> just doing all kinds of weird <laughs> tricks and spelunking. As long as the story is quality, as long as the action is great, I don't mind a longer runtime. That being said, the part one of it all does make me nervous of having a very long runtime and being the first chunk of something. Because then is it, this should have been three installments, or is there just too much fat here? Or I, I need to know more. I need to see the movie, honestly, to be able to decide if that <laughs> runtime is too long. Because right now, that does seem excessive. <laughs> but... I believe this franchise knows what it's doing, and if it needs that extra amount of time, hopefully they've utilized it well. As we've seen with lots of movies, short movies can feel really, really long. Long movies can feel like they're at a breakneck pace. It all depends on how it's all executed. So hopefully they execute this well. The only reason that I raise my eyebrow a little bit is because when you look at like some of the best movies in the franchise, like, like Ghost Protocol and yeah. Rogue Nation, like with, with credits, two hours and 10 minutes, you're probably talking without credits like two hours, five minutes, something like that. And those were tight, exciting, all killer, no filler, kind of beautifully paced movies. So part of me wonders, like, do you need the extra 40 minutes, especially if it's just part one? So I don't know, Ray, like whenever you start talking about movies that go over a two hour runtime, you see Ray's eyes start to glass over a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> what do you think about this? How long is this movie again? Two hours and 30. With, 36. Without credits, two hours and 36 minutes. I'm looking at John Wick chapter four. It's two hours and 49 minutes. Yeah, it was and real long. As long as they stay on that wavelength where it keeps me in, uh, anticipating the next scene or whatever, then it should be fine. It's really only 24 minutes longer. You know, than, which. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm saying right. it's only 24 minutes longer than. Uh, Ro uh, Rogue, so oh, the Rogue, but that's I, a full half hour episode yeah. of television. Well, I haven't <laughs> seen any of the Mission Impossibles. This will be my first one, so Ooh. um, well, no, I mean, we got to get you watching a couple of Mission Impossibles no, before you see this. This will be my first one. No, <laughs> <laughs> sit down. We're gonna get you to watch a couple of these. It's you only, for, at least palm. Start from it's only for palm. For palm, Clementine. I mean, I 
it look most action movies sometimes you get these action movies that go too long and they just fill it with action right but the problem is action is like anything else it can become exhausting and mm -hmm. it can become boring I don't know what magic pixie dust that they found for John Wick chapter four to constantly feel fill all the action in that movie because that movie's loaded to the tits with action how they were able to fill all the action in that and yet every beat made it feel fresh and made it feel new and I never felt exhausted with it. I'll, even some of the best action movies, if you go too long in the action sequences, it gets a little tiring. If Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning can get that, well, whatever they did with John Wick Chapter 4, then beautiful, then great. But it does make me a little bit nervous. Just a bit. Yep. All right. With that down, guys, we're going to take a second here and take a question from our Mint Mobile hotline question of the day. We love taking questions from Mint Mobile and our hotline question. And today we've got one about a brand new Barbie trailer that just came out. Check it out. Hey, John and crew. This is Jennifer calling from New York City. I was curious if you got a chance to see the new Barbie trailer that dropped today. Honestly, I think it's got the best trailer that they've dropped in the months since because it provides some of the plot line for the story. I would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks and bring on the filthy. Thanks a lot for calling that in, Jennifer. Um, you know, we were going to talk about the Barbie trailer yesterday, uh, but we kind of ran out of time. So they've dropped a new Barbie trailer. Now, look, a little bit of background here. I don't care about a Barbie movie. I mean, it's not for me. Not that other people shouldn't be excited about it. I'm saying I'm clearly not the demographic for a Barbie movie, right? Now, keep that in mind for a second because that becomes important. Then they announced, you know, Margot Robbie was going to be... Actually, you know what? Originally, the Barbie movie... Uh, who's the train wreck girl? It was Amy Schumer. Amy Schumer. They originally gonna, were going to do a Barbie movie with Amy Schumer, which I thought could have been a really clever juxtaposition, kind of turn everything on its head sort of idea. I thought that was a really neat idea. That eventually fell away, never happened. And then there was talk of Anne Hathaway doing a Barbie movie, which I love Anne Hathaway. I Straight up, I do not understand the hate Anne Hathaway gets. She is bloody amazing. She's mm -hmm. fantastic, but whatever. So I was excited about that. Then that kind of fell off. And then came the word years ago that Margot Robbie was going to do a Barbie movie. And like, well, I mean, other than maybe Pamela Anderson 20 years ago, I mean, would there be a better- Yeah, who you know, looks more like Barbie. Yeah, be a better casting than Margot Robbie, who also, by the way, is an Academy-nominated actress- um, it seemed pretty perfect. Then it added a couple of good Canadian kids to it. They added Ryan Gosling and Simu Liu to it as well. And they brought Greta Gerwig, who's an Academy-nominated director, brought her on uh, to direct the film. And then at least looked a little bit interesting. Still not that interested. The first trailer came out. I thought it was clever. I thought it was cute. But then they showed us this new trailer. And I realized this movie is not going to be what everybody thinks it's going to be. Like that moment in the trailer, I, I, I remember when we first saw it at CinemaCon, I laughed out loud when they're having this big dance party. And they're like, this is the best day ever tomorrow. Woo, everything's great. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, Barbie goes, you guys ever think about dying? And then the music stops and everything. And all of a sudden things start going badly, which things never go bad in Barbie land. And the whole idea about there's the real world outside of Barbie land. And Will Ferrell being the head of Mattel? Come on. Inspired. Come on. That looks so good and so great. And it just looks, when they were talking at CinemaCon about this, they had Greta Gerwig, Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling were on stage. And they talked a lot about the, how much everybody laughed all the time. But also in some of the early test screens they did, how, many, how much people cried during the movie. And I thought, you know what? They're doing something deeper with this movie. This And it's Greta Gerwig, so that totally shouldn't surprise us. And I'll tell you what, Jennifer, this trailer made me excited to see the Barbie movie. This trailer did it. I wasn't excited before. I was a little bit intrigued, but now I'm excited to see it. And it's because of this trailer. And that ultimately is the greatest compliment you can give a trailer. I wasn't interested in seeing this movie, and now I am. Chris, you were there for the CinemaCon presentation. Yeah. You saw the trailer. What did you think about the trailer in general? How has it impacted your overall 
anticipation for the movie? I mean, what do you think? Well, first, did this trailer have some different footage than what we saw at CinemaCon? Because I did not remember those really stylized Barbie driving shots. No, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. looked like Wes Anderson. Yeah. The, the quick little driving shots yeah. were not in the one they showed us. Yeah. Okay, CinemaCon. that's what I thought. There was, was like also a few things. Yeah. There was also a few things in the CinemaCon version we that saw that were this. not in this trailer. Yeah. But I'd say a good 80% of it was, was similar. Absolutely, yeah. And what we saw at CinemaCon, what we see in this trailer, I love. And I think it's a really smart trailer in that it covers what America Ferreira brought up at CinemaCon of her talking about, I'm not a Barbie girl. I'm, I was not into these as a kid. This movie, though, makes me understand the value of it. And I, I found a lot of interesting things that I really connected to and that got me emotional in this movie. And I love that the trailer markets to just that. If you love Barbie, this movie is for you. If you don't like Barbie, this movie is for you. I See, I remember I said, remember that I just said that because that's going to become important. Mm -hmm. That's why. Yeah. It's brilliant that they put that in the trailer. If you love Barbie, this is your movie. If you hate Barbie, this is your movie. And I remember thinking, that's genius mm -hmm. that they put that in. Because that spoke to me. Exactly. I think that's going to just get anyone who's on the fence about this movie of, oh, okay, so maybe there's going to be some tongue-in-cheek moments. Maybe we're going to poke fun at this kind of ideology that goes around Barbie or anything. I love Ryan Gosling and all of the clips of this movie. I think he's, he's so, so funny. Oh, I'm so excited about it. And I just really enjoy the aesthetic. I love that these are practical sets that they're using. I think it's going to be so fun and weird. And Jennifer points out that we get a bit more of the plot in this one. I guess, but I still don't know what this movie's about. I know Barbie's in the real world. I know that. I know yeah, that I she's mean, so, having a weird day. But I mean, I know enough. Right? Like, so like, if, this is a great example to me of I need a trailer to just tell me what the movie is basically about. Yeah. Give it too much. To me, this is it. Like, so Barbie is in, there's Barbie land. Life is perfect. Life is great. Things start mysteriously going badly. Things start to go wrong with Barbie. Mm -hmm. It leads her on some sort of an existential quest where she meets her wise man on the mountain that basically does pulls a Morpheus and says, take the blue pill or the red pill. Take she the heel or the that, Birkenstock. Ends up going into the real world to find her answers. Mm -hmm. That's that's all I need to know. Yeah, that's the story. And, and it feels like the more she thinks, the more she breaks out of that the box. Yes, that, that so-called yes. box that all the, the Barbies are in. Yep. Like it, once uh, the seal gets broken. Yeah, yeah. That's so very it's, true. it's 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 like metaphorical. I guess I you the, could say. the movie will explain this to me, but I do want to understand what Barbie Land is and how that translates to the real world. Of are those discarded Barbies? Are those the like pentultimate bar Barbies who Mattel is harvesting? Mm. What is their purpose? Which I know the movie will tell me, but that's what I'm kind of still left wondering about. It it. Seems like, what is this? It seems mm -hmm. like Mattel knows that world exists. Exactly. Right? So I want to know, okay, well, what is this What is this veil that separates the two realities? Yeah. I, I am, for one, very excited to see this. <laughs> so yeah, that's the Barbie trailer, and uh, I think it did an absolutely wonderful, wonderful job. All right. With that down, guys, uh, let's move on to this. This is another one that we did a, a video on a little bit earlier today, but I am a Transformers guy. I've told the story before, but as a kid, I would take all my allowance money. I would walk to Toys R Us. I would find whatever Transformer that I did not currently own. I would buy it, bring it home, take it out of the box, and then I would cut out the power levels uh, meter on the back of the box showing how strong, how fast, how, how, how much firepower all on this up and down zero to 10 chart. I would cut out the chart for that character that I just bought. And then I would cut out the illustrated graphic of the character on the front of the box. And I would tape those up on my bedroom wall. And my bedroom wall was covered in these transformer images with their power bars. Clearly I did not have a lot of girls in my room. When I was younger, that being said, I'm a Transformers guy. I liked the first Michael Bay Transformers movie very much. Look, I, look, I'm not afraid to tell you this. There's not many movies that I tear up in, but in that first Michael Bay Transformers movie, the first time Optimus Prime rolls out of the first time we see Optimus Prime in truck form, he rolls out of the mist in the darkness down the alley. And then the camera starts to spin around Optimus as he begins this very long, slow transformation process <laughs> with that damn sound <laughs> sound that I grew up with as a kid. And seeing Optimus Prime transform, I had tears in my eyes and I don't care who knows it. I, I wanted to hug somebody when that was going on. Now, all the other Transformers movies were total shit until Bumblebee came along. And Bumblebee was wonderful 
But as we said in the video earlier today, the Bumblebee movie paid the price for the suckage of the other Transformers movies. And while making more money than Black Adam did, it made 400 and something million dollars, it should, it deserved, Bumblebee deserved to be a billion dollar film. But too many people had been put off by the Transformers movies. And now we've got this new one coming, Transformers Rise of the Beasts. Now, unfortunately, it's not being done by the director of Bumblebee. Uh, Travis Knight, I believe, is the, the name. The, the guy who directed Kubo and the Two Strings. Mm -hmm. Instead, they got uh, Steve Cappell, who directed Creed Two. Did a very nice job directing Creed Two, by mm -hmm. the way. And I don't know. While I like the trailers a lot, it felt a lot to me like the Michael Bay Transformers. And not the first one. I mean, all the garbage middle yeah, ones. I agree. Yeah, it's just, just like, mm, like I like the trailers. But even though I love the trailers, I'm like, but it still feels like one of those Michael Bay Transformers movies. This is probably going to be crappy. And then they showed us this new trailer with Unicron and all that kind of stuff. And suddenly my, let's say hope, I started to develop a little bit of hope. Well, now the first reactions have come out. And if you want to be honest, critics have never been terribly kind to the Transformers movies other than Bumblebee. The first Transformers movie, get this, out of all the Michael Bay Transformers movies, you know what the highest critic score, the highest critic score, Chris, take a wild guess. The highest critic score? The highest critic score of all the Michael Bay Jonathan, Transformers movies. you say 69. 69. Uh, 52. You're close. Mm. 58. Oh, okay. Is the highest. That was the first one. Okay. The one I like. Mm -hmm. The first one out of 58. Revenge of the Fallen, Dark of the Moon, Age of Extinction, and Last Night got 20%, 35%, 17%, and 16%. Woof. Until Bumblebee came along. That got a well-deserved 91%. Wow. I mean, that's like, your kid's going to be expelled. Uh, now he's the top of the class. Yes. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now he's the valedictorian. <laughs> your kid's pulling Fs across the board, valedictorian. And it made, and it, again, it made okay money, $467 million, but it deserved more than that. So critics, other than Bumblebee, have not been terribly kind. But you know what? The first reactions have come out, and they're solid. They're really solid. Now, most of them are, hey, you know what? This movie's pretty good. Like most of the reactions I read were not, oh my God, this is the movie that will define 2023. No, nothing like that. But just the very fact that these critics are watching this going, you know what? They took what was good about Bumblebee and built on it. And that's the thing. The common course here seems to be that this movie is much more in line with Bumblebee than it is, say, with Age of Extinction. And it's like, for me, that's music to my ears. That's all I needed to hear. I did read one reaction where somebody said, this is now the best Transformers movie. <laughs> uh, eh. With Bumblebee, that's, that's a difficult thing to say. I, I'll believe that when I see it. But I don't need this Transformers movie to be an Oscar-nominated film. Just be good. And from what the word we're hearing is... It's it's good. Jonathan, let me ask you this. You're probably like me and most of us. You hear there's a new Transformers movie coming. It's not being directed by Travis Knight. So there's a little bit of apprehension. Honestly, before the reactions came out, before that, let, let me get your thoughts on two different time periods. BR, before reaction. Okay. And AR, after reactions. What have your anticipation level been like and what have you been expecting from this Transformers movie? Uh, before reactions, it was like a fool me five times situation. <laughs> uh, I was like, yep. no, never. Not. Uh, I think I saw the first three and I was like, I'm so angry. I skipped four. We did the Age of Extinction. That was the fifth one, right? I think Age of Extinction was the fourth. And then the last oh, night oh, sorry, was the, the fifth Yeah, one. the night. Yeah. The one with the Dinobots. We had to do that because I was working with you guys at AMC. Right. And I literally was sweating as I was watching this movie. Like, <laughs> it, it made, gave me, like, gut pain. Um, so I was forced into that situation. And I never looked back. And I never watched to this day. And I actually will see So you've Bumble never Beat. seen The Last Night? Well, we saw that and I hated it. Okay. That was the one that was forced to with AMC, and then we were going to do a review of it. We all hated it so much, we never did that review. Was that The Last Night, or was that Age of Extinction? I'm pretty sure. Maybe that was Age of Extinction. Because The Last Night is the one that had Anthony Hopkins in it. Okay. Did you see the one with Anthony Hopkins? I think I did. Okay, so yeah. that's what... Because yeah, yeah, yeah. that was 
like that was as bad as the other ones were. That was the worst one. I was literally embarrassed. Oh yeah. I was embarrassed. I was like embarrassed. I was turning like red. Like I was the one that was responsible for this. So I never saw. (laughs) You felt like you had to walk out of the theater and apologize to everybody else walking in. I'm sorry, guys. I'm so sorry about this. Uh, (laughs) I was today years old when I learned Anthony Hopkins is in a Transformers movie. He did it for the kids. Oh my God. But I never saw Bumblebee. Oh, Tony, how sweet of him. Because of that. And I think I will see Bumblebee. You guys kind of convinced oh, me to see dude, it. Oh, dude, you've never watched good. Bumblebee? Yeah. You're in for a treat. And I, and I do like that it's a prequel set in the 90s. So does Bumblebee come out? Is that in sequence now with the with this newest one? Because they're both in the 90s. Maybe. I mean, look, they. there's a lot of talk that while it is pra- it feels very much the same, some people believe that Bumblebee is kind of a reboot. Yeah. Even though they all kind of look and sound sure. exactly the same. Uh, but the great thing about Bumblebee... I knew the movie was going to be different because it starts on Cybertron with this amazing opening sequence on Cybertron. And I'm like, I'm in. And then they got back to what it really needed to be. Like Michael Bay, when he did the first Transformers movie, at the heart of it, he said, this needs to be a movie about a boy in his car. And that permeates that first movie. And I think that's why I like the first movie. There's heart to it. Enter Haley Steinfeld, and now it's about a girl in her car. So much heart, yeah. so much charm, so much humor. Uh, the action is great. John Cena is actually really good in the movie too. I actually really like John Cena. Well, he started he he started like just leaning on this. Doesn't have to be good dialogue. It doesn't have to have a good story. It just has to be spectacle, and we'll make billions. I literally think he felt that way. Like anything I do makes a billion, so I don't have to worry about all of this and. You know, you've heard me say before, I, I've said this a lot, that that phrase I use called action without narrative purpose is just visual noise. I coined that phrase because of the Transformers movies. It was the Transformers movies that made me go like after the first one, I think, yeah, you've got this big hodgepodge orgy of spinning metal and light and sound. But like the audience didn't even know what it was they were looking at. Most of the time, the audience couldn't differentiate between which one's a Decepticon and which one's an Autobot. Mm. And wait a minute, time out. Why are they fighting right now? Yeah. Why is this battle in the well, street happening? At it this treated point? audiences. It had like, no narrative purpose. Yeah, it treated audiences like we were stupid. And, and what was the last one? The last, last Bay night. one? Well the, well, the last one was Bumblebee. Because the one before the that last, was the, the last, night, was last, Bay the last night. Because yeah. when I was doing like the little chart of like the domestic or, or worldwide uh, totals, that drop off was crazy. It from wasn't the insane. And I was like, no wonder he stopped doing them because he was cheesing people along for well, like the three before that because it was making a billion dollars. Yeah, Dark of the Moon made 1.1 billion. That was the third one. The fourth one, Age of Extinction, made 1.1 billion, right. also a billion. And then the light bulb went off in the audience that went, we're not going to be fooled yeah, by this yeah, again. Yeah. So the last night came out and went from 1.1 billion for Age of Extinction to 600 million. It dropped nearly in half. Mm. I mean, it, it was just thing. But to, so to hear this reaction is great. Now, Chris, I know you probably didn't tape up Transformers power level bars and things on your bedroom I wall. I didn't, but I watched the 96 Beast Wars, the oh, CG you, one. Yeah, right. That was fun. Yeah, with Optimus. Uh, you're uh, dope, that's why. Optimus Opti- Primal. Primal, yeah, there we go. But still Megatron. <laughs> I I gotta admit, I'm not a fan of Beast Wars. Aww. Yeah? Yeah. I'm, I'm really more of a, of a G1 kind of Transformers. That's the totally original fair. one, yeah, that's what, I'm more of that. Uh, you know what? Transformers and Ninja Turtles are the only, like, properties where even if the last movie was bad i'm still gonna watch the next one it's I'm just that you. way with it's just that mm-hmm. way with me you know i like to get you dumb. on the nostalgia yeah yeah those are the two yeah. properties not so much ninja turtles for me but transformers i'm the same way yeah but because it's, transformers only comes out every now and then if you really look yeah. as many movies as they had it's like jurassic world it's like an event like those those when they come out you you have the fans that really want to go see it no matter what the last movie yeah. did Indeed. All right. With that down, guys, let's get into our uh, final topic here before we move on and take our viewer questions from our channel members. That's this. So we've been talking a little bit about Little Mermaid recently. Um, I had a chance to go see it the other night. Chris had a chance to go see it the other night. We both really quite liked the movie a lot. I Mm -hmm. I thought it was fair. I I don't think it's the best Disney live action remake, but it was pretty damn charming and I am not a Little Mermaid guy and and I was really impressed with the film. I thought it was very charming. 
Halle Bailey is a <laughs> fucking superstar. This girl is going to be, wait until Color Purple well, comes out. I was going to say, yeah, Color Purple. This girl is going to blow up. She's got it all. She is one, I mean, I'm listening to her sing. Because I normally, I just want to hear an actor who can sing. Forget that. She's a world-class vocalist. Yeah. Like when she's belting out part of your world and every other song, I was, I almost felt emotional. Like when I see yeah. somebody exhibiting their talent, whatever that talent is, and they're like beyond like global scale good, I get emotional about it. Whether it's somebody who dances or somebody who, mm -hmm. whatever, this girl's singing and I like, well, I'm, I'm hearing angels sing. It's incredible. You're a musical theater guy. There, There is a moment when you're watching live theater, when you really, when an amazing vocalist just connects with the audience, that they can be singing the happiest song in the world, but your like your eyes just well up because it's that expression of emotion that's so big that you have to sing about it. And Halle, ba Halle Bailey's voice, Halle Bailey's voice, excuse me, is the, is the absolute pinnacle of that when she sings something you feel it on a cellular level so and she to your she, point oh, go ahead I, okay I'll just, uh, so quickly to mm -hmm. your point about that when i started going to watch musical theater that's when i realized oh all of our favorite pop singers suck <laughs> stage singers are the real greatest singers in the world mm -hmm. that they're like 10 times better than whoever you're one or two minor exceptions whitney houston maybe whatever but Celine Dion. Uh, ba or Celine Dion. But basically, your favorite musical artist sucks compared to <laughs> stage performers, right? Go watch Les Mis if you want to hear real singers. Go see Hamilton if you want to hear real singers. But I'm watching this, and I'm thinking, Halle Bailey? She could easily slide into the cast of Les Mis, and she would fit in just fine. Oh, seamlessly. Like, she, she's she got pipes for days. Well, anyway, here's something interesting. We've been asking about, are people going to go see this movie? We think they are. How many? Here's a little anecdotal thing that I think is kind of interesting. The Disney remake of Aladdin, which by the way, as a movie has a 92% audience rating. I love Aladdin. I think that movie is fantastic. I really do. Not as good as the original, but I love it dearly. And Aladdin joined the billion dollar club. Now I've been saying that I don't think Little Mermaid will make a billion dollars. It doesn't need to hit make a billion dollars to be considered a huge smash hit, but just, you know, for what it's worth, I don't think it's going to hit a billion. Well, Aladdin did make a billion. And its opening preview night, when it had its opening preview night a few years ago, it made $7 million on its opening preview night. Now, that's a pretty good number for an opening preview night. Little Mermaid made 10 on its opening preview night. Now, that is not to say that's going to extrapolate over the weekend and that means that Little Mermaid's going to have this huge weekend and that ultimately Little Mermaid will make a billion dollars. Just because Aladdin did, that doesn't mean Little Mermaid necessarily will. I think personally think Aladdin's a bit better, but I like Aladdin more than most. Well, maybe I don't like it more than most people. Like I said, it's got like a 92% audience rating, but at any rate. Um, while I don't think that necessarily means Little Mermaid's going to make a billion dollars, I still don't really think it will. But it's a good sign. Like in the world of good news or bad news, when you're making that kind of money, that's a pretty good thing. Chris, you saw the movie. I mean, it's hard to say what's going to happen with its opening weekend. But opening weekend aside, I personally think the word of mouth is going to be pretty good on oh, this movie. Yeah. I think families are going to go back to see this multiple times. I think they're going to encourage other families to go see it. I think this opening night number of like $10 million bodes well for them. I still don't think a billion, I don't know, how ultimately do you think this movie's going to fare? I think it's going to do really well. I think it's not going to have the same numbers as Super Mario Brothers, but it's going to have the same kind of effect of repeat visits and kids dressing up cosplaying to go see this movie. I think it's going to be a packed theater for the next few weeks. Because my screening, the, the early screening we went to, these kids were so captivated. They were gasping. They were really enthralled. Everyone acted so well it was a whole bunch of like six-year-olds at a 6 p.m screening or something <laughs> and usually when you have kids in a theater right they talk and they do other things everyone was so entranced by this movie 
I think parents are going to continually take kids to it. I think childless millennials such as myself love the nostalgia of this and the execution of this. I think it's going to do really, really well because, like you said, the word of mouth is going to be really positive here. And after Disney not having a great track record for live action adaptations, you've got Aladdin, you've got Cinderella, but everything else really has fallen flat. I think this is going to be a big win for them. And a lot of people are going to come out to theaters, especially those folks who are going you know, I need to take the kids to see something else and I can't see Mario Brothers for a fourth time. <laughs> I can't Let's do it. I need it something new. Let's go. I think it's going to do really well. I and mean, rightly so. We've said before that the, that's the thing. I think some people are going to be turned away just because, di- let's be honest, Disney's track record with their live action remakes is to be kind, hit and miss. They got a couple of really good ones and they got several that are really bad. So it'll be interesting. Jonathan, I am curious though. You're the only one in the room with kids. And now they're not, your kids are of the age that they're not children anymore, right. but, yeah. but you know, there's the, the your kids you, and, and by the way, girls, you've got a bunch of girls in the house. Has Who are there been so infinitely cool? Has there been any scuttlebutt? What's the scuttlebutt <laughs> around your house about your family want to go see it? How do you think it's going to do? What do you think? I got to be honest. Uh, if there's interest, I haven't heard it. <laughs> Oh, no. I mean, I'm sure there's interest, but they haven't been huge on, like you were saying, they haven't been huge. Like, they love the animated stuff. They haven't been huge on, on the crossover, you know, live action stuff. Well, it's, the, the record's been so spotty. Mm-hmm. And I think they just, they, you know, they kind of also grew up because of mine and Laura's age. We showed them all the original stuff, right? And so, frankly, it's been like, uh, we're going to see, there's more hype about Across the Spider Verse, like they're really excited for that. Um, the Flash, um, they wanted to see uh, Guardians three. Only one got to because two were sick, unfortunately. So it's like that kind of stuff they're more into, and not so much this. They wouldn't be opposed to seeing it, but I think, like, just being honest, like I'm probably the only one that wants to see this in theaters. A house full of girls. Jonathan's the only one in the house that wants to go see it in theaters. Well. Guys, um, what do you think? Like, are you guys excited to see this? I'm telling you, it's it's a pretty good little movie. I enjoyed it. It's a lot of fun. I think if you're a big Little Mermaid person, I think you're really going to have a good time. At any rate, that's my thoughts on that. All right, guys, listen. With those topics now down, we're going to move over and start taking questions from our YouTube channel members. We put up a post in our community tab asking our YouTube channel members if they had any questions. We're going to get to those now. But before we do, we're going to take just a quick second and thank the sponsors of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, our friends at Helix and my mobile service provider, Mint Mobile. This video is sponsored by Helix Sleep. Their Memorial Day sale is running now, and it's a great time to upgrade your mattress. You can get 25% off your purchase for a limited time. Check out the Helix site for more details. Guys, Helix Sleep offers the best premium mattresses, custom fit to your needs, conveniently shipped right to your door. And in case you're not 100% sure which mattress is best for you, Helix Sleep's quiz matches you to the perfect mattress based on your body type and sleep preferences. Guys, you know Ann and I have had our Helix mattress mattress for almost a year. And even when we go to Las Vegas and stay in these beautiful hotel rooms, we can't wait to get home to get a great night's sleep in our Helix mattress. The mattress comes rolled up in a box and is easy to set up. And there's even a hundred night sleep trial to test the mattress out to ensure that you love it. And good news, Helix is having a great Memorial Day sale that goes from May 15th to June 4th. Visit helixsleep.com slash campia to get 25% off your Helix mattress plus two free pillows during their Memorial Memorial Day sale running now for a limited time. We want to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. From the gas pump to the grocery store, your utility bills and favorite streaming services, inflation is everywhere. Seriously, make it stop. Thankfully, there's one company out there that's giving you a much needed break. It's Mint Mobile. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton with phone plans starting at just $15 a month. You guys know that ever since I switched to Mint Mobile, I've been saving almost 70% a month over my old phone plan. For people looking Looking for extra savings this year? Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just $15 a month. By going online only and eliminating the traditional cost of retail, Mint Mobile passes the significant savings on to you. All of their plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. 
Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. And thank you to our friends at Helix and Mint Mobile for sponsoring this episode of the John Campia Show. Hey guys, remember, when you go and check out and support our sponsors, you're actually supporting us on the show. So make sure you look down in the description of this video. You'll find links and promo codes for both Helix, who've given me my best night's sleep ever, and my mobile service provider, Mint Mobile. And thank you again to those guys for sponsoring this episode. All right, guys, with that down, let's get on over now and start taking questions from our channel members. Chris, what do we got up here first? From, ooh. Zaheos. Zaheos? Hey, crew. Just wanted to let you know uh, that the podcast format helps with my new job as a security guard. Oh, nice. Makes the guardhouse less boring. So thank you all and keep up the amazing work. You know, I, I get so many messages from people that are just like, like, and this has gone on like before we made the transition or anything, because we've always put up the podcast, right? But just saying, oh, it's just so great. I've got my commuter, my drive, just being able to hang out with people in my headphones, just talking about movies, Aww. right? And that's, I love getting things like that. So thank you for taking us along to work with you, man. We appreciate that. All right, what's next? From Joel. Hey guys, do you think that Disney really had misplaced confidence with the response to Indy 5? I think they must have thought it would have gotten better notices playing at Cannes six weeks prior to the release. I think it's going to hurt them. You don't often see a studio make that mistake. When a movie's not great, they hide it. When they're confident, they show it. I think clearly Disney had confidence in the film. And listen, I, because the last I checked, Ray, maybe you can look it up. The last I checked, it was at a 45%, which is not good. Not the worst. That means almost half the critics like it, but still... Not what you wanted out of an Indiana Jones movie. I think you're absolutely right. I think Disney took it to the Cannes Film Festival, believing it was going to get a better reception than that. What, what What's it sitting 51. at right now? 41? 51%. Sitting okay, at 41. So 51. Oh, 51. Yeah. All right, so it's gone up a bit. Yay! It's gone up since the last time I checked. The, but criti the criticisms that you, or not the criticisms, but the reviews that you're uh, reading on that one uh, episode or show, they... They weren't that bad to me. Like they were just saying, "Oh, no, they weren't that bad." It, it didn't do anything to move the or like it didn't do anything new. This and that. Yeah, that sounds fine to me. You yeah, know like what I, mean? I didn't read like like this is the important thing to point point out too. The positive reviews, none of them were saying this is the greatest Indiana Jones film ever. But it's also important to point out that the negative reviews. We're not like, oh, this movie's so bad. No, it was for them. The negatives kind of outweighed the positive. It's it's it sounds like around fifty percent is exactly where this movie should be. So I listen. That means half the critics like it. So maybe when I see it, I'll like it. Um, half the critics don't. Maybe when I see it, I won't. Maybe I'll love it. Maybe I'll hate it. I don't know. But Disney, I think yes. I think they got caught by surprise because by taking this thing to to can that early and letting a public audience see and let word getting out, they clearly thought the response was going to be better. So yeah, I think they were caught with their pants down a little bit. Ha <laughs> ha! All right, what's next? <laughs> Red One Real Talk. John, you've mentioned how you don't enjoy the teen aspect of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that most of those movies lean into. So I'm curious, is there a Ninja Turtle adaptation or comic run that doesn't lean into that which you've enjoyed? The 90s films and the early 2000s animated series that dives deeper into sci-fi elements are my favorite. The original black and white comic run of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is always going to be the best iteration of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It was awesome. Me and my friends, when we were younger, we got so into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when they first came out. The black and white, deadly serious kind of thing in, in this world where they're fighting the foot. It was so good. It was so good. It is the true Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And then at some point they thought, hey, let's make it for kitties. And let's let's have them love pizza and skateboards uh, and say cowabunga. Stuff is freaking great. Because I got news for y'all. That ain't the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The original black and white teenage run of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, what they were originally designed and created to be, if they ever got back to that, I'd be all over it. I'd be all over it. It is a far superior product to the thing they've got uh. up there now. <laughs> Ray and to each their own, right? And to many people are completely disagree with me, to and I respect that. Own. I respect that. But if you treat yourselves, listen. If you've never read Just the original self. black and white TMNT comics, 
You owe it to yourself. Go check it out and you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, what's next? From Norrell. Hey, Campia crew. Have any of you gotten a chance to watch Beef on Netflix yet? If so, what are your thoughts on the series? Thanks for a great week, guys. Have a good one. So Ann and I, I, I haven't yet because Ann and I decided that was going to be one of the shows that we watched together. And it's difficult for us to find time to watch shows together. So we hadn't started. And then Ann finally got tired of waiting. So she <laughs> blasted. She got through the entire. Well, sorry. In three days, she's gotten through almost the entire series. She only has the finale still to go. And she loves it. Um, so I still have to get on it. I'm going to have to, like, Anne's going away. Uh, she's, uh, going to the East coast for a week for work. So I'm probably going to use that time to get caught up on a lot of stuff. So I will probably watch beef in about a week and a half when Anne takes off for a while. All right. What's next? From Mighty Tank One. Whenever John and crew are dying laughing after a sponsor break, I love inside jokes. Love to be a part of one someday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great. Michael Scott. <laughs> Michael Scott. That, I love inside jokes. I Listen, you, you got to understand, um, it is not about me trying to make some kind of an exclusive club and leave you guys out of the joke. It's about us keeping our sponsors. <laughs> it's about keeping our sponsors and not wanting to get canceled <laughs> right now. Not letting you all hear the horrible, horrible the things. Horrible, terrible things that come out of our mouths. There's a real popular quote that we I think we've all adapted <laughs> that I created one day, which if said would probably... Get us Here's off. the sad thing. I don't even know which one you're talking about because there's like 20. Oh, uh, come on. We all the we same. All the same. We, all the same. we all the same. We all the same. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> the lead into that. Don't we, John? We all sound the same, we right? We all sound oh. the same. Yes. The, no more that said. Is the no no more said. Year, baby. <laughs> no more said. Yes, it is one that gets repeated Sometimes around here a lot that we will never repeat on air. We all the same. We all the same. We we same. Never repeat <laughs> on air. That's half the saying. That's half of it. All right. What's next? From Yosef. Dear John, I know you're. they're doing a pen, penguin spinoff. Do you think a Catwoman Zoe Kravitz spinoff could work? I'm less interested in that. Um, listen, I think Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman in the Batman was great. Yep. I really do. Yep. As a supporting character. I think she's fantastic. Much like I love Hawkeye, but I think Hawkeye works best as a supporting character. I love Black Widow, but I think Black Widow works best as a supporting character. The Penguin, though, I, I immediately thought when we watched that movie, I could watch a show about I, this guy's story. Colin Farrell, who is an Academy-level actor, could make a very compelling thing in this seedy underworld that Matt Reeves has created. So... I mean, listen, if they decided to do one with Catwoman and Zoe Kravitz, I'd be down for it, sure. But would I be nearly as excited as I am for, say, like this Penguin series? Probably not. But if it's a if they could develop a compelling like heist story and it, sure. and it expands the rogues gallery of Gotham, and then we see a little bit more of her like experience and expertise leading there's, you to another Batman. There's definitely things you can do, yeah. right? Stories you can come up with. But like Again, they did it with Hawkeye, and I wasn't thrilled with the results. They did it with Black yeah. Widow, and I wasn't thrilled with the results. But, but yeah, again, I'd and, be down for it. And Penguin seems to dip in with everybody, like the good guys, the bad guys. He seems to have like oh, his, his finger in everything, everything. You know what I mean? So absolutely. All right, what's next? From a man, Obi Wan premiered one year ago today. Oh my God, has it been a year? Oof. A year of me arguing with my husband about the merit of this show. <laughs> Although I had my issues, and it really should have been better, I still really enjoyed it. For you, what was the best and worst part of the show? With Without question, the best part of the show to me was in the final episode, the fight between Obi-Wan and Vader. That was a, that was, oh, Ray is disagreeing with me. No, it what's the best Baby Leia, baby. Oh, she, was a, she was great. She was the best part of the show. She was great, but. Scene-wise, I agree with you. But but as far, yeah, my favorite moment was that fight between uh, Vader and, and Obi-Wan at the end, because I love the fact that it's like, listen, a lot of the Obi-Wan we've often seen, put put the Clone Wars thing aside. A lot of the Star Wars we've seen, like Obi-Wan is the wise old mystic, right? In, in many ways. But why was Leia going to him in the first Star Wars movie seeking the help of General Kenobi? Oh, here's why. Because he's Obi-Fucking-Wan Kenobi. And he will make you his bitch. And when he just bitch slapped Vader around... <laughs> At that last fight, Are I mean, I, I was like, I was feeling like, I was really feeling like for the first time we're seeing the real Obi-Wan Kenobi. Like that, That's why. I did. Now, unfortunately, 
the show didn't carry that. I mean, I really liked the first episode. I loved young Princess Leia a lot. I, I adored her. But overall, it was such a disappointing show. And, and, and it bears repeating that there are a couple, but one in particular, some very ingenious editor took the series and re-edited it into like a two and a half hour movie, moving some things around, adding a couple of things, cutting a lot of stuff out, rearranging some scenes. And as a two and a half hour movie, it worked really well, like way better than the series did. But yeah, unfortunately for me, oh, the Obi-Wan series is one of the one is one of the series that's in the loss column for Disney for me. But you argue, you and Logan argue about this. Did, did, Logan, did you... lo remember that Logan, dear sweet Logan, loves Crystal Skull. Oh, that's true. <laughs> also, Obi Wan is his favorite Star Wars character. He has a theory for for um, guys that you go through stages in your life where when you're a kid, you're Luke. You're all about Luke because you identify with him. When you're a teenager or a young man, you're all about Han because you want to be that cool guy. And then once you're older, you're like, no, I want to be Obi-Wan. I just want to be a guy who has shit together. That's all I want. So he loved the Obi-Wan series and constantly rewatches it and will tell me about how wrong I am for not liking it. <laughs> it's real fun in my house. Yeah, it wasn't that bad. I didn't. It's not abysmal, but I don't think it's particularly... Good. No, it, it wasn't. It wasn't painful to watch. No. It was just. A, I just kept watching and thinking, this is such a missed opportunity. Yeah. This could have been so good. Because the same thing bothered me, like with the Green Lantern movie with the right Reynolds. It was like the same feeling I got, where this guy could do so much more, but he's holding himself back. It was annoying. Like it was like, yeah. you know how uh, Ryan Reynolds was like, I, but I'm too scared. I'm too scared. They did that way. Too, they did that scene way too much in that movie, where I was like, you have all the powers. You could. Go at least try to fight. Okay, in, in, in his in the character's defense, though, he was very new to it. Yeah, so he was figuring it out. Yeah, well, but, right. and they just spent a lot of time on things in Obi Wan where you go, "Well, I know Luke's going to be fine. I know Leia makes it out of this." Yeah, I mean that's the problem with any kind of prequel yeah. stuff, too, right? All right, listen, we're almost at time here, so we're going to race through as many as okay. we can. Here. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All right, Alex Colwell. <laughs> hey, John, have you seen slash What are your thoughts on Alita and Valerian, two sci fi movies that I wish I loved but didn't? So, do you think they'll get sequels? Have heard about Alita in some instances. Okay, there's never going to be a Valerian sequel. No. no. And I felt so bad because the the producer of the film invited me and Anne to the world premiere. And we went to the premiere. And we had to stand there at the after party. He's like, what do you think of the movie? I'm like, man, visually it was gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, the was. lighting was so good. The costumes. <laughs> and visually it is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Valerian, the City of a Flat Thousand Plants was beautiful. It's a terrible movie, though. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not good. Um, and I always feel bad when I would go to one of these world premieres and not like the movie, but you know, I had to be honest with them. Um, Alita Battle Angel, I liked. Yep. I had fun with it. I, I don't think it was great, but I watched them like, yeah, damn, that's that's damn good. I'd, I'd watch another one. I hope they do get a sequel. I don't think they will. I know there's been a lot of talk about it getting a sequel. I don't think it'll get a sequel, mm. but if they do, I'm down for it. All right, what's next? Matt G. Hey, John and gang. The general feeling is the new Transformers trailer looks good, but the projected box office is lower than expected. Do you think they should have made a different style of trailer to make it clear that this isn't a Michael Bay Transformers? Let's be honest. There's nothing they could have done. Now, the opening weekend box office projections have gone up, as a matter of fact, as a result of this trailer. Like, I think it was originally projecting for like a $40 million opening weekend, and now it's like gone up by like 50% to like a 60 plus million dollar, and it could go up even more. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how that all turns out. All right, what's next? From Red One Real Talk, hey team, have you seen the disastrous reviews for the Lord of the Rings Gollum game? It does not look pretty and is a major shame given how good some of those games have been. Oh, I didn't even no. know there was a Gollum game. Uh, yeah, me, me neither. Me neither. I love Gollum. Ray, you look Ray to the point. Did you know about this game? Yeah, it's like a stealth game. You play go go. I, the you just videos look in, the videos look incredible, but I get man, this is this really bums me out because oh, it's too bad. I've not I've not even heard of the game. You don't get many Lord of the Rings games. House. So man, that's all right. What's next from Gannon? Is Amy Adams currently the most talented actress without an Oscar? Six nominations, which really should be seven, as I thought her performance in Arrival was overlooked that year. I think there is a strong argument that she is. I mean, I'm trying to think of somebody else who is a better actress that does not have an Academy Award. I mean, does Helen Mirren have an Oscar? I should know this. <laughs> Can you look that up? Quick, yeah. uh, get Logan. Let me text Logan. Can you call a Logan? <laughs> I mean, if if it's not Amy Adams, it might be Helen Mirren. Or 
Isla Fisher or Flint. <laughs> the one uh, I don't think. I don't know. I don't know. Like Amy Adams. It was, it was just. I know a, a lot of people confuse Amy Adams. Oh yeah, Fisher. she won for the Queen. Okay, she did. Oh, that's right, she did. Win and she's been Queen. nominated numerous times as well. But, okay, yeah, so here. yeah, she's like good. I think the single most gifted uh, actor in the the best actor so in the her. world without an Oscar on their mantle is Rafe Fiennes. But if we're going to get specific and talk about actresses, you know what? Amy Adams might be that one. She might be it. She's incredible. All right. What's next? Imperial Executioner. Per deadline, the Blade Runner series on Amazon may be delayed up to a year because of the WGA strike. Not surprised. Do you think some projects like this will get a second look and possibly get canceled instead? Or maybe the opposite, as in we should get more excited for the unstarted projects that studios stick with despite long delays? There are going to be some series that get canceled. I'll give you an example. Um, now, it wasn't a sh- as a result of a strike, but it was, a result- it was still a work stoppage, the pandemic. Our friend, uh, Aaron Cummings had a show lined up. She was going to be a regular cast member in a brand new show. The show was greenlit, all that kind of stuff. Pandemic hit. Got delayed, 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 and they eventually dumped it. And then after they dumped it, they reimagined it and launched that same show with a totally different cast and went in a little bit of a different direction. It was the Lincoln Lawyer. There was the original Lincoln Lawyer was going to be a totally different show and Aaron was part of it. And then the project just kind of fell apart because of the pandemic. There were shows in development that were got, that were greenlit during the first writer strike that then never came to be. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that's going to happen to all of them. Of course it's not. But there are going to be some shows right now where there are writers and directors and actors who are thrilled right now that they've got a show coming. Yeah. And it ain't never going to happen. So oh. we'll see. Pre-pandemic, I was in the, the short list for a travel show host gig. <laughs> and really? then the pandemic happened. And I was like, well... Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and then yeah. the whole thing got scrapped. All right, let's take two more. Then we'll have to call it a day. All right, Blake Mason. My wife and I will be going to the Hollywood Bowl in July for the first time, and we're seeing John Williams. We'll pro- me and Anne will probably be there. Never have seen him before. Extremely excited. Any tips or advice for attending the Hollywood Bowl? Are you going? Yes, you are. I'll, I'll be there. Although it, it it happens over three nights, so I don't know that I'll be there the same night you are. But a couple things. Park at the... Hollywood Hotel on the corner. I forget who owns the hotel now, uh, but there's a big hotel at the corner of Hollywood and Highland. And I can't remember. I think it's a Lowe's Hotel. L-O-E-W-S. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's Lowe's. The Lowe's Hotel, they have a big parking lot that you can park in. And then it's about a 12-minute walk from there. But believe me, getting around the Hollywood Bowl when there's a concert going on that night is a nightmare. So just go right to that hotel, park in its underground parking lot, and walk there. Go at least an hour early, um, get your seats, all that kind of stuff, and enjoy. One word of warning, don't expect John Williams to be on stage the whole time. Um, Over the years, Ann and I have gone about seven or eight years in a row now. Over the years, he's actually on stage less and less and less. It used to be that he would do the whole concert. Then David Newman, who is the conductor of the LA Philharmonic, would do the first half of the first set, and then John Williams would come out, they'd do an intermission, and John Williams would also do the second half. Lately, David Newman does the entire first part of the show, and then there's the intermission, and then John Williams will come out. Last time, David Williams, the first part, after the intermission, David Williams did a little bit more, and then, or David Newman, and then John Williams came out. So, I mean, the dude's in his 90s, right? Yeah. So, so, give up. so don't expect him the whole show, but buy a lightsaber, because whenever they start playing Star Wars music, the whole Hollywood Bowl lights up as thousands of people take out lightsabers and wave their light. It's one of the most beautiful sights you've ever Aww. seen. Uh, and have a good time. All right. I, last, I would, oh, I would add ahead. just one more parking option. Go to the LA Zoo for parking. It's oh. free, wide open parking. And you pay six bucks. You get on a shuttle bus, takes you right to the gate and brings you back. And brings you back. Oh, that's yep. great. Yep. That's Or, or you can Uber. I was going to say, that's what I usually do. But if you Uber... A little more than an hour in advance. Yeah. Go maybe two hours early because then they also have a dedicated place for Uber drivers to come and pick you up. But uh, Jonathan's suggestion is also a very good. We've done that once. All right. Last question of the day. This is from Callum. Hey, crew. Do you see James Gunn announcing the new Superman and Batman at Comic-Con this year? Or is it too early? Hope you guys have a nice day. All right. Let's put it this way. I'll be shocked if he doesn't announce, if he doesn't bring out the new Superman at, at Comic-Con. Batman. Don't know. They don't have a start date for Batman, so so that's fine. I so I don't I don't know about Batman, but I really do believe we're going to see Superman. I get, I don't know that for a fact, but that's what I believe. Uh, a Batman different than Robert Pattinson? 
there's going to be no, no, oh yeah, yeah, yeah because are, James Gunn's oh, there's the, D, the D, there's going to be the DC Universe Batman and then Robert Pattinson okay. is a separate thing. All right, guys, with that down, that'll do it. For today's and nay, this week's installments of the John Campia Show podcast. Thank you guys so much for joining us and making this little show part of your day. Big special thank you to our channel members for sending in those questions. Number one, because you gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, by being a YouTube channel member, you support us and everything that we do here. So thank you so much for that support. A uh, little bit of announcement. This Sunday, there's going to be a Little Mermaid open spoiler discussion. So make sure you guys come by and check that out if you guys go and see the movie this weekend. And other than that, We'll see you on Monday, guys. Thanks a lot for being here. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.